before chanting. The Sangha is invited to come back to our breathing so that our collective energy of mindfulness will bring us together as an organism, going as a river with no more separation. Let the whole Sangha breathe as one body, chant as one body, listen as one body, and transcend the boundaries of the elusive self liberating us from the inferiority complex, the superiority complex, and the equality complex. The insight that brings us to the other shore Oh. 
most respected Thai, dear Sangha, today is the 27th of December in the year 2018, and we are in Plum Village, Thai, on the third day of our core retreat to begin a new year and to end an old year. So, dear Sangha, uh, let us come back to our body. Let's sit up straight. Enjoy our breathing. Close our eyes. And look deeply into our, into our body. This body is not just 20, 40, 60 years old. It has been there for billions of years. I cannot take it lightly. I cannot look down on it. This body contains all my ancestors. Not only all my blood ancestors, but also my spiritual ancestors. It contains all my descendants. I cannot take it lightly. I cannot look down on it. The whole universe is to be found in this body. The dust of the stars, the sunlight, the earth are all in this body. This body is not just matter, it is also spirit. I cannot take it lightly. It is not an instrument, a tool, but a wonderful manifestation of the miracle of life. I want to take good care of this body because it is a flower in the garden of humanity. I want to take good care of it so that it can go beautifully into the future. This body contains all realms contains the Buddha land, the pure land, the kingdom of God. I cannot take it lightly. Since you have been here, you have been singing, I have arrived, I am home. And I don't know whether we have been practicing as well as singing it. Do we feel that we are at home, that we have arrived? That anywhere on this planet Earth, or on any other planet for that matter, can be our true home. 
Otherwise, it's just words that we sing. It doesn't become part of our life, our practice. The orchid is our home, whether it is in Thailand or whether it is in Malaysia or anywhere else. The trees are our home, whether they are oak trees or whether they are magnolia trees. So every day as we practice walking meditation, we have the chance to walk so that we can touch our true home at every moment, wherever we are. And our true home is like our cell phone. We can take it with us wherever. take it with us wherever we go. But it's much more useful than our cell phone. When we heard the sound of the clock, did you feel you had arrived? You were at home in the here and in the now. That is what the sound of the clock is for, to help us feel that we are in the here and in the now. We don't need to go anywhere. We don't need to, to do anything. We just need to dwell peacefully in the present moment. Sometimes we go back home after we've been away for a time. And when we first arrive home, we say, home, sweet home. We feel it's nice to be in a place where everything is familiar, where we know where things are. And we feel we can relax when we come home. But after a few days, after coming back home, we don't feel at home anymore. We don't feel we've arrived. We feel there's something better, there's something other that I need. And maybe that thing is only in the future. I can't touch it now. Maybe the better thing that I need is the pure land or the kingdom of God and when I die I will be able to go there if I've been a good student of the Buddha or of Jesus Christ and the pure land and the kingdom of God will be so much better than this world this planet earth That is our hope, our hope for the future that stops us from being happy in the present moment. Because the future is always uh, going to be better than what is available now. But what is available now is your body, a true miracle, a true wonder of life and many other bodies, many other species around you. Also, true miracle of life. And you have two eyes, you have ears, you have hands, and you can touch these miracles at any moment that you want to, as long as you are really there in the present moment. One time a journalist uh, interviewed Thay and at the end of the interview asked Thay, do you have any special special teaching to give to me? And Thay said, 
go home and heal. And so after hearing that, she went and bought an air ticket back to her country so she could go home and heal. But Thay said she had not really understood the teaching. I did not mean to buy an air ticket and go back to your native land. I meant to come back to our true home, which is the present moment on this wonderful planet Earth. Of course, our planet Earth is suffering at this time, but she's doing her best, and she's still a miracle. She's still a wonder for us to be in touch with every day. And when we can relate to the earth like that, we will quite naturally take much better care of her. Because we will see that the earth is not just matter, just like our body is not just matter. The earth is also spirit. When you walk today and you touch the earth with your feet, can you feel that the earth is not just matter? Your feet are also touching spirit. The earth must be spirit. She's given birth to the Buddhas, to Jesus Christ, to the Bodhisattvas, and to us. The earth is not just matter for us to exploit, for us to consume. So let's consume a little bit less. Every day during the retreat, we have a chance to practice sitting meditation. It is a real privilege to be able to sit and to do nothing. Is it possible to do nothing? We have a lazy day every week, and people look forward to lazy days. You can, stay, you can stay in bed a little bit longer. You can do what you like. You don't have to go to the Dharma tour. <laughs> so we really look forward to Lacey Day. But when Lacey Day comes, do we really know, do we know how to be lazy? Or do we need to take out our iPad or our telephone? During this retreat, we will try and learn to be lazy. Someone said that they're very proud of themselves because they left their laptop behind. They didn't bring it to the retreat. And we feel very proud of you too if you leave your laptop or your cell phone at home. Or if when you come here, you give it to the, the monks and the nuns to uh, take care of for you. <laughs> we feel very proud of you. But the thing is, when you go back home and you have your laptop again, you have your cell phone again, will you continue to use it in the way that you used it before the retreat? Or will you relate to it differently than you did before the retreat. Because that is why we have the retreat. It's to help you when you go home. It's, not, it's wonderful to have a break and people say, the reason I come to the retreat is to charge my batteries. That is to charge my spiritual practice battery because they've got a bit Low. They 
recharging. So the Sangha, the fourfold Sangha, will help me recharge my battery. But when you go back, will your batteries just run down again? And then you have to come back and recharge them? Or is there a way that you can recharge your batteries when you go back home and not just in the retreat? So during this retreat, we may be looking deeply. When I get my laptop back, will I use it differently than I did before the retreat? Will I be able to work differently than I did before the retreat? Just imagine that this is your last retreat and you won't be able to come to another one. So you need to really experience as deeply as you can the walking, the sitting, the eating, so that when you go back home, They've become part of you. And listening to the bell has become part of you. So you don't have to make an effort. And whenever you hear a bell or a telephone or a clock, you just naturally come back to your breathing and come back to your true heart. In the time of the Buddha, there were some monks who really liked to practice what are called the jhanas, kind of meditative absorption. And one time there was a, a monk who said to the Buddha, Lord Buddha, I'm very old and sick, and I don't have the concentration to practice the jhanas sometimes make me very sad. I feel I'm not doing what I should be doing as a monk. And the Buddha said, you don't have to practice the jhanas. Because what you need is insight. And the insight comes from mindfulness and concentration. Insight in Buddhism is the grace that liberates us from, from our suffering. And the mindfulness we practice in Plum Village will lead to concentration and it will lead to insight. Practicing mindfulness every day in our daily life it allows the seed of insight deep in our consciousness, of intuition deep in our consciousness to be born. So what we need is the very practical mindfulness meditation in daily life. And sitting meditation it's not to make a huge effort to make ourselves tired, to be a hard work, to try and achieve something that lies outside of ourselves. Sitting meditation is just 
to enjoy sitting. And when you come to the meditation in the morning, that is a kind of food for you to enjoy. The Sangha has devised a timetable so that you can have a so that you can have nourishment at every moment of the day. So sitting meditation, you come in and you follow your breathing and you allow yourself to be nourished. That is the most important thing. And if you feel during your sitting meditation that you have peace, and that you have nourishment, then you will want to do it whenever you can, not just in the meditation hall. Before the bell has been invited for a meal, you also want to feel that peace and nourishment. So you come back to your breathing, you come back to your body. The most important thing about meditation is what we call the oneness of body and mind. That is what we want, the oneness of body and mind. You cannot have a body without spirit. You cannot have a spirit without body. They are two manifestations of the same thing. You see this uh, sheet of paper? You cannot separate one side from the other side. You cannot separate your body. And if you try and separate your body and your mind, you know what might happen. Do you know? You might go mad. Well, none of us want to go mad. Huh? So always in meditation, you bring your, your body and your mind back together. And what is it that helps you to bring your body and mind back together? It's your breathing. Your breathing is like a bridge between your body and your mind. When the baby is just born, in the womb, the mother breathes for the baby. And when the baby is born, the baby has to breathe for itself. Once the umbilical cord has been cut, the baby has to breathe. And in the lungs there is fluid. So the baby has to bring the fluid out of the lungs and then take the first breath. And I think in Chinese, the word for breath, also means comfort. So when you, uh, when you take a breath, you feel comfort, you feel you survive. And your breath, your mindful breathing should also bring that kind of comfort. It's not to make an effort. It's to enjoy the breathing. It's for your enjoyment. So your breathing will bring your body and your mind back together. The first four breathings of the Anapanasati Sutta are called breathings on the body. And they include the breath, because the breath will come from your lungs. But when your mind through your breath, that is, that is also your spirit. So when you come to the sitting meditation, just enter. Don't try. If you have the guided meditation, 
What should happen in guided meditation is that the words do not go to your intellect. They should go to somewhere deeper. If I say the word peace, it does not go, need to go to your intellect, but you already feel peace. And if I say the word war, it does not need to go to your intellect, you already feel an unpleasant feeling. So when we do guided meditation, don't, don't go through the intellect. Just let the words go into your consciousness and feel, feel the words. And that is true for the person who guides the meditation. They should not be using their intellect. And it's also true for the person who listens to the guided meditation. And if you don't have guided meditation and you want to guide yourself, you should do so in a very light way, without any forcing. And sometimes when you come to meditation, when I come to meditation, I feel very tired. And what I do then, I don't close my eyes. I just say to myself, I say inside to myself, Dear Sangha, please meditate for me. And I just allow the Sangha to meditate. And I feel the energy of the Sangha meditating for me. And when I come to the sitting meditation and I feel well, as I breathe in and out the first breaths, I say, Dear Sangha, I'm meditating for you. So it works both ways. We do it together. So when you go back home, you do need the Sangha. Even if you imagine you couldn't come for a retreat here again, you need your local Sangha to breathe with you, to walk with you. So uh, in the first four breathings, it depends which version you use. There are several versions of the, the Anapanasati Sutta. One is called Anvantu Yi, and that is the Chinese version. It's a little bit different from the Pali version. And in the Pali version, we notice our breath is long, and then we notice our breath is short. But in the Chinese version, we just recognize whether your breath is long or whether it's short. And that means you accept your breath as it is. And then you come on and you, you, you recognize your body, your whole body. And in Pali, it says, aware of the whole bodily formation. And I think in Chinese it says Tang Han. Tang Han. So when you think of your body, you think of it as a formation, a samskara. And a formation is something that is changing all the time. This constant input and constant output. If you look just at one cell of your body, it has a membrane around it, a permeable membrane. And there's always thing coming into the cell and going out of the cell. You are the same, your body is the same. The air, the sunshine, things that are coming into your body. At the same time, things are going out from your body. So that is why we call our body a formation, because it's changing all the time. And it's being made up of things that are not it. Your body is made up of everything that is not your body, many things. So that is to help us when we contemplate on our body, to call it the whole bodily formation. So
So having been aware of our breathing, having been able to accept our breathing as it is, we will notice that our breathing gets a better quality, a higher quality of breathing. At first our breathing it may not have been so enjoyable, but now we feel the quality is much better. It's going deeper into our body and it's maybe going slower and it's bringing us more nourishment. So first of all, we just recognize this is in and this is out. And you can use the words in and out. But when you use words, you have to engage the words. They're not just words for you to think about. They are your whole being. So you're really in and you're really out. In and out. And then you recognize the quality of your breathing. Deep, slow. It's got deeper, it's got slow. And you feel happy with your breathing. And then you recognize your whole bodily formation. And the thing about recognizing, the next step after recognizing is called acceptance. It's a very important step. Acceptance. Accept your body as it is. One time, uh, in a question and answer, somebody asked, I have a daughter. I was so proud of her. I loved her so much, and we loved each other so much. But when she became a teenager, she changed. Actually, she changed every day, but you know, she changed. And uh, she didn't love me anymore. I don't love her anymore. She's very difficult. She now go on many paths. I don't approve of. What can I do? I want to get back to how it was before. But actually, your daughter before she became a teenager, in a way she, she's died. Well, she hasn't really died, but that child has died in order for a teenager to come. The before teenager has to go. <laughs> so we can't really go back to, to the how she was before. So I said, there's just one thing you need to do for your daughter. You have to accept her as she, as she is. You have to accept her, although she may be going on a path you don't consider to be a path of virtue. It's not what you want her to do. You still have to accept her 100% as she is. And after the acceptance, you will know what to do what to say, and what not to do. And then after that, one another practitioner came to me and he said, I'm not happy about that answer you gave. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right, huh? <laughs> he said, we always have to make an effort to do a little bit better to go a little bit further. We cannot just accept things as they are. We have to try and do better. What do you think? Do you have any ideas? Is it a good answer or not a good answer? Anyway, it's for you to work out for yourself. I don't want to to tell you anything different from what you experience in your daily life. But if we come back to the body, our 
property. Of course we want to we want it to get better if it's not well. But what is the first step? The first step is to accept it as it is, is it not? We have to accept that my body is like that now. It doesn't mean that it can't get better, but at this moment, it's like that. And if we want to fight with our body, to have a battle with our body, if we want to run around trying to find what kind of medicine, what kind of doctor, and on the other hand we don't, we don't accept how it is now, then I think it won't be so easy for us to make the next, the, to know what to do, to really know what to do, and to know what not to do. So if in our sitting meditation we come back to our body, and our body is Hence, our body is in pain. The first thing we have to do is to accept it. That is how it is. And then after that, once we're relaxed enough, we can use our breathing to help us to relax. And when we relax, it becomes less painful. And by the end of the sitting meditation, maybe the pain has, has gone because we were able to relax. So that is the fourth breathing. Breathing in, I relax my whole body. Breathing out, I relax my whole body. exercise that I learned when I first came to Plum Village, Thai taught me. In those days, uh, we had very simple exercises. Thở vào tâm tính là thở ra niệm những người ăn trú trong hiện tại về phục đẹp tuyệt vời. Breathing in, I calm my body. In Vietnamese, it's thumb. <laughs> in English, it's uh, body. Now. Breathing out, I smile. Dwelling in the present moment. It is the most wonderful moment. And then you appreciate, you appreciate the words. Calm. Smile, present, wonderful. And so we use words in our meditation. We don't have to. But a word is also very helpful. Because a word is like a container, like this. Uh, bottle, it contains water, and the word contains a meaning, and that meaning can keep us, keep us concentrated. If we don't use words, our mind will wander off somewhere else sometimes. But as I said, we have to engage the word with our whole being, with our body, with our spirit. So calm, it really means calm. It's not calm, what am I going to have for breakfast? <laughs> because we can, we can have an empty word, like we can have an empty, an empty bottle. Calm, smile. 
A smile is wonderful. A smile is also a kind of acceptance. And a smile, it, uh, the muscles on the face, they are connected to certain neurons in our brain. And when we smile, it sends a message to our brain, which neuroscientists say, if you put it into words, the message would be, everything's okay. The why? So that is a good message for for us to receive, and the smile helps us to do that. So any time of the day, in sitting meditation, in the dark when nobody's looking at you, you can smile for yourself. Just be. When I was uh, just new in Plum Village, Sister, uh, Sister Jiang Kong told me one exercise, please, little sister, smile more. <laughs> smile every half hour. <laughs> so I tried to do that. Calm, smile, present, wonderful. Present moment, the moment when we are alive, without any worries about the future, without any memories about the past, just there in the present moment. Just to feel, to feel life. Feeling, it can take the place of thinking. When we dwell in the present moment, we don't need to think. We can just feel. It doesn't mean that we have no mind. Of course we have mind always there. Feeling always there. Perception is always there. <coughs> and then the present moment, wonderful moment. And one time, in a, also in the question and answer, somebody who's working in palliative care said to me, asked, I work in palliative care. I want to teach people who are dying. Calm, smile, present moment, wonderful moment. But maybe smile and wonderful moment is not possible. <laughs> maybe it's too much to ask of someone who is, who is dying. Could we change it to calm, ease, present moment, only moment? So they ask that question. What do you think? Do you think you can you can smile and have a wonderful moment when you die? You know? Very encouraging to hear. I was with my father when he was dying. His last moments he had a lot of difficulties, but those last moments were very peaceful, very wonderful. Yeah. So I think we can have a wonderful moment. I know one uh, elder nun in Vietnam who practiced calm smile, present moment. And she said that when I when I die, I'm going to die smiling. 
But she said to her disciple, please take a photograph of me <laughs> smiling when I'm dead. Huh? And so the disciple took a photograph and sent it to us in Tanguy to be smiling. But this is not just a meditation for you to do <laughs> when you're on your deathbed. It's a meditation for us to enjoy now. And the wonderful thing about it is that you can use it any time, any place. You don't have to go find the meditation hall, the Buddha statue, in order to practice it. There's a king, uh, <coughs> a Vietnamese king, Trang Thai, um, who lived in the 13th century, maybe 12th, 13th century. And uh, he was a Buddhist king. Really, he didn't want to be a king. He wanted to be a monk. But his teacher, his monk, his teacher who was a monk, didn't allow him. He said, your people need you. They need a good king. And you are a good king. So you have to sacrifice your idea of being a monk in order to serve your people. So with the feeling a bit reluctant because he had gone to the mountain to escape from the palace in order to find his teacher up on the mountain. And he wanted to stay there with his teacher and practice as a monk. But his teacher said, no, you go back down there. Because if you stay here, the court will all, will be your court, your ministers at court, they will all come up here and disturb my meditation. <laughs> go back down there. But remember, it's very important that as a king, you continue to practice, however busy you are. And so six times a day, he would leave the affairs of state, whatever he was doing, in order to practice repentance, in order to practice beginning in you. And he, in the, in the palace, he had a, an altar where he would come and light incense and practice touching the earth and a little bit of meditation, probably not for longer than five or six minutes, and then he would go back to the affairs of state. So we all need that in our daily life. And if we are saying, oh, I'm too busy to do walking meditation, I'm too busy to breathe when I hear the telephone. We should remember from Taipan, the king. And we say, if a king could do it, the king is busier than I am, then I should be able to do it too. And it's not just, you may not have a Buddha altar. You don't need an altar to practice. We've heard about the incense of your heart, mindfulness, concentration, and insight. And one uh, psychotherapist who learned the practice thought, how can I, during my busy day, I have to see so many patients one patient after another, after another. How can I have the practice in my daily life? So he worked out a way. When he finished seeing one patient, he would practice walking meditation with the patient to the door of the building or to the waiting room. 
and for his next patient who would practice walking meditation from the waiting room to his consultation room. So between each patient he had walking meditation, which is practice, which is the spiritual damage. We have to receive a lot from a lot of suffering from our patients. So we need to be able to let go of one lot of suffering before that. Yeah? psychotherapist has to uh, take care of himself or herself, otherwise he will end up being the patient for another different psychotherapist. There is a kind of food. We have four kinds of food. There is a kind of food that is called consciousness food. Today I'm a little bit lazy to stand up and write a little bit. Maybe I should. <laughs> There's a part, there's a level of consciousness which is in Buddhism called stored. It's, we're not usually conscious, it, call it consciousness, but it's really unconscious. <laughs> we're not usually aware of stored. So we have, uh, we, in, in our daily life, from our feelings and our perceptions. We receive many information, if you like, which has to go into, which will be kept in, in store. We don't lose it. So uh, we can have to take good care of what what kind of information we receive during, during the day. And just like we said about the psychotherapist, he received a lot of suffering from his patients, and they all that will go into the store, the store consciousness. And uh, if he doesn't uh, able to take care of it, then he will become the patient rather than the psychotherapist. So some people they uh, they watch a lot of violent films, and then somebody says no. Oh, you, you shouldn't watch that, it's not good for you. But, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect me. I just, uh, when I, after I've seen it, I forget it. So sometimes we think like that. That after we've watched the film, we go and have a meal, we, we talk to people, we laugh, and we 
play and things, and we think, oh, the film we didn't have any effect on me. But in fact, it has. It has to. Everything will be go into school. Even if we're not aware of it. So we have to be careful. But what goes into store is something that will, will be helpful for us in the future. Once when Thai was teaching, Thai said that. You can, if you have the happy moments from the past, you can use to nourish you in the, in the present. And if you feel you didn't have any happy moments in the past, the present will become the past very quickly. So you have a happy moment now, and then you will be have some happy moments from the past. So that is what we, we need to do with the the fifth breathing and the sixth breathing of the Anapanasati Sutta. We need to nourish ourselves with the happy, with the happy moments. Once one of my uh, mentees was not present in the Sangha activity, I said to her, what were you doing? You should have been in the Dharma sharing. You weren't there. And she said, I was storing up wood for the winter. I understood what she meant because I, I talked about that in the Dharma talk. I said that when it's, this is in Europe, when it's cold, and there's snow on the ground, you can't go down and chop up a tree to make wood for the fire. It's too late. When the sun is shining in the autumn, you need to prepare for the winter. And then you will have the wood, you can light the warm fire, keep yourself warm in the winter. And it's the same with our consciousness. We know that we will have difficult times to go through and therefore we need to have the wood to light the warm fire when we're going through the difficult times. So then I, I said, to her, oh, well, how were you, what kind of wood were you chopping up for the winter? And she said, oh, it's so beautiful now. It's the autumn. The leaves are golden and red and the sky is blue. I just wanted to go out and enjoy it. So I, I couldn't really say anything. After all, I had talked in the Dharma talk. You have to do that. So I can't scold her for not being in the Dharma sharing. When we were in, uh, in Korea, it was the springtime, and the magnolia trees were in, in blossom. And Thay said, uh, because the magnolia, because I am here, the magnolia can be there. If I'm not really here, the magnolia blossom also cannot be there. It cannot become part of my wood uh, in my consciousness for me to be able to enjoy the difficult moments. So in our sitting meditation, we practice breathing in. I know I'm alive. And breathing out, I feel the joy of being alive. And the joy of having two eyes to see. Another question I was asked in a 
question and answer. Was I practice many times. I have I know I have two eyes and I'm very happy, but I don't feel any happier. Every day I say to myself, I have two eyes. I feel happy. But I don't really feel happy. I just say it. So I think that we need to use our eyes. And then we will feel happy. Because the eyes on their own, of course, are not enough. You have to have the object of the eyes. You have to have the three things. Huh? You have to have the eyes, the form or the color, and you have to have the eyes, consciousness. You have to have the consciousness. Three things you need. So if you just repeat like a parrot, I have two eyes, therefore I feel happy, but you don't feel happy, then you have to look deeply. The eyes are there. The eyes can see because there is light, because there is form, because there is color, and because there is consciousness. And when you see all those things, it's a miracle. And you feel very grateful that that miracle is manifesting for you. So we can practice like that. And then we practice breathing in, I feel happy. Uh, breathing out, I feel happy. I'm happy because I have a part, a part of practice. My teacher has handed on to me a part of practice. Someone who doesn't know their part is very suffering. It's a big suffering not to know your part, not to know your way. Calm, smile, present moment, wonderful moment. That is a path. There is no way to calm. Calm is the way. So you know that you have a path because every moment on that path, you already see the, the, the end. There is no way to calm. The calm is on each step of the way to calm. And of course, in order to discover that we have a path, we have to practice. We have to practice it. And no two people have the same path. We can help each other, we can make suggestions as to how we practice. But in the end, everyone will discover their path themselves. And that is why now in the West, I don't know, in Asia, you have this phenomenon. It's called double belonging. It means you. Double belonging. It means you're Christian, but you enjoy going to Buddhist retreat. <laughs> Or you're a Buddhist and you enjoy going to Christian retreat. You have to find your, your path. And so the practice of mindfulness is something that is, is relevant to all paths. You can be a mindful Christian, a mindful Hindu, a mindful anything. You can even be a You can be even a mindful atheist or a mindful, not have any religion at all and practice mindfulness. And this is something in the West that we have quite a bit. Secular mindfulness. Because many people are tired of religion. 
they had enough of religion, so they don't want any more of it, thank you. And therefore we can say, you don't need religion, you can just enjoy mindfulness in your daily life. Enjoy eating your breakfast in mindfulness, brushing your teeth in mindfulness. You don't need a religion. But with the practice of mindfulness, you will be in touch with the wonders of life. And then you will feel a kind of, a kind of awe. You feel how wonderful life is. And that is a kind of religious feeling, a spiritual feeling. So we have mindfulness practice centers in, uh, in Europe and America. No, no Buddha, no incense. And people just come there to walk mindfully, breathe mindfully, eat mindfully. So maybe the important thing is that we can we can balance our our work with our practice. And there's one way you can do it is like the King Chan Tai Gong did. And that is to take a break from your work every now and then in order to practice meditation or mindful walking, but there's another way you can do it, and that is to work and be mindful at the same time. It's not easy when you're working on a computer to practice mindfulness, so we really need to have a way to stop when we're practicing mindfulness and working on a computer, and you need a bell on the computer or you need to get something to come up on the screen and tell you, please stop and breathe. Close your eyes and enjoy your breathing for a few minutes. And uh, to be able to practice uh, total relaxation at work is wonderful. Your work, uh, your workmates and you have a place you can lie down and one of you can guide a total relaxation in the middle of the day. The afternoon will be much easier to get through because of that. And in fact we can't practice relaxing when we're walking and when we're sitting, it's not just when we're lying down. We just have to remind us. And sometimes you say, relax, relax. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> it's not enough to tell yourself to relax. You have to recognize, I'm not relaxed. I'm agitated. That is the first thing, the first step. And you have to accept, I'm not relaxed. I'm agitated. And then after that, you begin to feel a peace, a peace of acceptance. And uh, you begin to feel more relaxed. And the door to relaxation is open. And that is why in the Satipatthana Sutra, you don't just recognize, I'm desiring, I'm hating, you also recognize, I'm not desiring, I'm not hating. We're not angry all the time. So we have to recognize, I'm not angry at this moment. And that will nourish the long anger in us and help us to feel joy. Breathing in, I feel joy because I'm not angry. Breathing in, I feel joy because I'm not desiring. Breathing in, I feel joy because I don't have a toothache. When you have a toothache, you think, there's only one thing I need. Pull out the tooth and do something to stop the toothache. 
and then they have a wonderful opportunity. Somebody can help you not to have a toothache. And you feel, oh, this is the happiest moment in my life. I don't have a toothache. And for the next 24 hours, you keep remembering, isn't it wonderful not to have a toothache? But then after two days, you forget that it's wonderful not to have a toothache and you start complaining about things. Sangha, thank you for being here this morning. Mm -hmm. We now listen to three sounds of the bell to end. 